Welcome back to the podcast, Vishal. Hey, Peter, how are you? I'm Thank you for having great. me back. Okay, you're, you're welcome. So first question I want to ask is, uh, is where are you today? You, uh, you're outside, it looks like. I know you're based in New York, so let us know where you are. Well, well, Peter, I didn't know that this was going to be a video podcast. <laughs> and uh, so I was going to do an audio podcast. I have been using COVID uh, as an excuse to start to get out more and travel and walk around the city. So my wife and I have a regularly scheduled walk. And so I said, oh, you know, and I'm going to have to just break away and do this podcast. And so <laughs> uh, now that it's on video, so we are actually, I'm in the meatpacking district. As you can see, it's totally empty there's a restaurant that's opened up. So I'm frequenting it. It's a, it's a, it's a Mediterranean restaurant. And they were kind enough to offer me a table and, uh, and a place to video. So here we are. All you know, right. It's COVID is the era of improvisation. It is indeed. It is. indeed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of which, let's just, uh, why don't we uh, get started by, you know, obviously you guys have, um, have been impacted dramatically as, 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 as everybody, it's obviously for the impact on, on better seems to be a, uh, seems we've been mainly positive, but before we even get into that, let's just take a step back and look at the, the mortgage market over the last three months. I mean, what, just, just tell us what, what, what the state of the mortgage market is and what's changed. The mortgage market is gone from near death to bursting with activity over the course of the past three to four months since COVID struck. So in the beginning, uh, COVID struck and the administration unveiled the capacity for consumers to get a forbearance for up to 12 months and, uh, you know, and, and lay that out in, uh, in law, which I think was just awesome. But what that meant is that mortgage servicers and mortgage investors were inundated with calls uh, for forbearances because the level of unemployment and the, the ferociousness of, with which it hit was just completely unanticipated. And in mortgage land, servicers are expected to advance principal interest and taxes and other things to the investors while consumers might be on forbearance. Right. And so suddenly you saw major form, firms like Quicken, United Wholesale Mortgage, Loan Depot suddenly stop originating because they didn't have liquidity available to be able to service the consumers who wanted to have a forbearance in place. People who were buying mortgages didn't want to buy mortgages that were being originated by the market um, and because they were unsure how, what percentage of people will apply for forbearance. People were thinking it might be 20, 25%. So to be out principal and interest on a loan, uh, which you know for a year, on 25% of your production, that is just billions and billions and billions of dollars. And these are not right. companies that have been well capitalized to do that. And so fundamentally, it just little put a grinding halt to it. At the same time, interest rates started coming down and COVID started to have a real impact in people not being able to go to the office. And so many, many, many large chunks of the mortgage market was just taken out of commission. Uh, and at the same time, consumers, capacity and willingness to refinance their mortgages. They're sitting at home themselves, like working from home. They all want to refinance their mortgages and bring their monthly costs down. So it's just created this triple whammy where liquidity dried up. The consumer's need for mortgage was greater than ever before. And the traditional industry players sitting in their bank branches or the mortgage broker branches all around the country weren't able to go to the office and log on to their mainframe div and systems. And so it's been absolutely the perfect storm. Um, and, you know, the mortgage market is only now really recovering from that. Right, right. And so for your company specifically, I mean, I, I've read articles, uh, you know, saying that you are, you've been hiring like crazy. Um, what, just take us through the, the, the specific impact on you guys. Well, what was interesting was, um, you know, we, so much of what we do was validated in the past three months. Mm -hmm. um, People have been saying, well, I heard everyone else is a digital mortgage company too. Everyone else is, you know, doing this other stuff with home finance. People have platforms and, and you know, uh, we have been saying, you know, that's lipstick on a very, very old pig. Right. Uh, and, <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, the, it was, it, but it's very hard to prove it until things like this happen. So one, COVID happened, the forbearance rate on our mortgages that our consumers have taken we had always thought, oh, if we give people a better mortgage, they'll be able to better afford it. 
And yes, they were able to better afford it. And so the forbearance rate on our mortgages was one eighth that of the traditional conforming loan wow. forbearance rate. And so it was less than 1% compared to 8% for the average Fannie Mae direct mm -hmm. originator. Uh, so that gave us market access to liquidity when almost no one else had it. So literally it was like the top three mortgage originators in the country had access to liquidity and us. And that allowed us to A, keep the lights on and continue to satisfy customer demand. Two, we actually have a really amazing workforce now. You know, it was 1,500 people when, before COVID started. It's 2,700 people now. And um, we were, because this platform is entirely built from scratch, the first new loan origination system for the mortgage industry, this $15 trillion industry built from scratch in the past 25 years, everything is capable of being done in a browser window or on your mobile and including all of the work that our, uh, our, 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 our own team does. So we were able to adopt to work from home really quickly and we were able to keep everything going. And then the third thing is um, our, through this, we've learned that we can actually onboard and teach people how to become experts in mortgage really fast on our machine. Something that's not possible actually on your traditional mortgage software systems where you have to learn seven different systems, all these hotkeys, all this sort of stuff. There's literally a servicing system that charges per keystroke. So people learn all sorts of control F9 like type of keystrokes just to learn how to like use it. And we've been able to do that. And so we've been able to rise to the occasion and meet our customers demand, uh, which has been really gratifying and fulfilling for our team as they're all working from home other than the people who are most necessary, like on the closing team, to be able to close for mortgages. Right, right. So how much of an increase in demand have you seen? Um, since COVID started, we've seen a 3x increase in demand. Since wow. last year, we have seen an 8x increase in demand and growth. I think the last time I spoke to you was about two years ago. We are 15 times bigger than mm -hmm. we were two years ago. Um, and, you know, I, I get the question a lot. How do you know it's a tech company? Well, you know it's a tech company when you can scale 15x in two years, right? right? And, and like, there's nothing, you know, we're not even a tech company. We're a growth company. That's really what we are. And we can satisfy our customer's demand, but customer demand has been through the roof and we are just working very, very hard. Our teams are working 24 uh, seven to be able to satisfy that customer demand. So what about your, I'm cu curious about the, uh, uh, you know, you're getting a lot of inbounds. Are you, what, what about conversions? Are you finding that there are people just out there shopping around? Are you finding conversions are maintaining what they were before? Um, so interestingly, we are up at 40% organic traffic now, 40% up from zero two years ago. So part of that is people are just getting to know us better. Mm -hmm. uh, but more and more people, uh, I think 18% of users type in better.com and they're starting to search on better when they're looking for a refinance rather than search on other platforms that have traditionally been places where they've searched because of they know that we have the better price guarantee. They know we are, they, we can deliver. Uh, maybe they'd considered a refinance six months ago, nine months ago, hadn't gone through with it. Now rates are really, really tempting. So, um, and then conversion has held still this month. We're going to fund about $1.8 billion of mortgages. We are at north of a $20 billion a year origination rate. Um, and the percentage of people going and visiting the site and actually following through into application and, and locking is, uh, continues to grow. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So then, and, and what type of loans are consumers uh, trying to lock in? Are they, are they locking in, you know, like a 30 year fix, 15 year fix? Are they doing like seven year arms? I mean, what, what, what are they doing? N for all the product differentiation that the rest of the industry talks about and the need to have all these different complicated products, we have like the world's largest product catalog of U.S. mortgage products uh, across our 32 investors. But 90% of people go for a 30-year fixed rate mortgage because fundamentally consumers are seeking the, the benefit of longer amortization, which lowers right. their monthly payment, which allows them to live you know, save money and live a better life with all of the other money that they can use. And fundamentally, the, the usability of the asset mm -hmm. is, in, is, is a, it's, it's a long dated asset. It's not a car that's going to go away in five years, seven years, 10 years. It's right. literally, sorry, pardon the noise back there. But, okay. uh, it, you know, it's going away. It, it, the, the house is going to be there for 30 years or right. longer. Right. So it makes sense to borrow money that to match. We've seen people on the other side, we've seen a demand for cash out refinancing. 
So people are consolidating all their other loans, their car loans, their uh, personal installment loans, their credit card loans, and leveraging the value of their homes to be able to do that. So we're seeing demand for that. And most surprisingly, we are continuing to see month on month growth. So we had a pause in March, April for COVID, like the depth of COVID. And now we're starting to see massive uptick in demand to buy a home. First time home buyers, 40% higher for first time home buyers coming onto the platform. Um, The average age of someone getting a pre-approval on better has gone from 40 years old to 36 years old in the space of three months. Um, and, and all of that is, is just indicative that COVID has surfaced this long hidden desire. We thought, you know, the millennial generations, the Airbnb generation, they want experiences, not assets. Well, fundamentally, you know, I think now they're staying at home. They're, they've gone to the suburbs. They're living with family. They're doing, and, and the expression of the hidden expression of desire or the object of desire to own your own home is manifesting itself in a way that we had uh, we had thought was going to take a lot longer. Right, right. Okay, so um, before we go any further, I do want to get sort of I want to um, you to describe your business model because it's it's somewhat unique in the fact that you know you really you, you don't charge uh, fees, no commissions. Um, so why don't you just describe how better makes sure. money? Sure. So our business model is is actually very similar to the business model of companies like Amazon or 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 Kayak or Alibaba is that we are actually a multi-sided marketplace. So consumers log on to the website. Um, they don't get charged any commissions or any fees. We don't have any commissioned employees. Um, you know, uh, and so you get on the site, you can find your rate in three seconds. You can get approved in three minutes. You can lock your rate and know what your cost of housing is going to be for the, for the next 30 years in 15 minutes. And then you can fulfill the rest of the process entirely online. If you want to talk to someone, there's someone sitting and waiting to be able to talk to all the time. You have a dedicated uh, loan expert, but separately, you can also just go through the process entirely by yourself. And, um, and you're able to do that with certainty, with speed and backed by the better price guarantee, which means that we will match anyone else's price out there in the market um, and then beat it and give you something extra. Um, you know, and, and, and what that provides consumer certainty is that they're not going, they can, they can rest easy on price and focus on process and savings and, um, and, 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 and know that they're going to be able to close on their new home. So we think what we've done is taken the most stressful element of the home ownership experience, which is how to pay for it and how to like translate a $300,000 house, which very few of us have $300,000 walking around, right? That's a lot more commas and zeros than most of us are used to, uh, and turn that into what we can actually digest, which is $1,520 a month. And that's our unique, unique value proposition. We turn $300,000 or $400,000 or $700,000 into an affordable monthly payment. And that's what I think consumers can understand. And, and because of the way we do it, by getting rid of the commissions, by automating the process, by uh, getting, uh, taking things like homeowners insurance and title insurance and putting it all in one seamless, fast, easy flow, guaranteed by the better price guarantee, what we're able to do is help them basically afford a better house in a better school district with a shorter commute to work and therefore live a better life. And I think that's the consumer's value proposition on the front end. On the back end, the way we do it is we've built a matching engine that takes consumer attributes property attributes and matches it with investor criteria. We have 32 investors on our platform. They make up about 80% of the value of all mortgages originated in the country. And what we've done is eight of the 10 largest banks are there, many of the largest insurance companies. These are end investors in mortgages. And what they're able to do is buy a cash flow string with more detail and more data off the better platform. They submit pricing and requirements to them. And we built a rules engine that's not like, one lender, one warehouse line, one set of underwriting criteria. We take all of their criteria and we are able to match them. Effectively like a massive, awesome, recursive, like VLOOKUP table, right? For all the Excel sort of like, you know, uh, aficionados here. And by doing that, we're able to give a consumer the best price that they qualify for across the entire range of products that they could possibly qualify for whether it's non-QM or Jumbo or Prime or Conforming or Fannie or whatever it is, instantly. 
And uh, I think that's what's so powerful is at the back end, at the front end, we're basically Charles Schwab E-Trade for mortgage. And at the back end, we're basically NASDAQ for mortgage. Right. And so you're making money on um, like selling of these loans, right? Is that, that that's, that's, the, that, yeah. that's the revenue stream. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Investors pay us a premium for the stream of cash flows that a better mortgage right. produces. And that premium is effectively not even paid for by the consumer because the consumer is getting a lower rate than they can get anywhere else. It's being paid for by the commission salespeople that we've cut out of the picture. It's paid for by the automation that we've done to reduce the cost of like data verification and underwriting. And then it's paid for by the surplus spread that we're earning the investor by getting the consumer a better house that they can better afford, which then leads to outperformance. Right, right. And one thing I've always wondered about your model, and I'd love to hear um, you explain it. So you said you've got eight of the top 10 largest banks, all of whom I imagine are also providing mortgages direct to, you know, to their customers. Um, how can you like, I guess, why do they buy your, your mortgage at a markup where what they're doing themselves um, you know, they're obviously competing against themselves in, in some fashion. So explain yeah. that sort of dichotomy. Yeah. And, 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 and it's getting even weirder now because two years ago we didn't have a B2B platform. Now we basically have like Amazon AWS slash third party seller marketplace where for Ally, for American Express, for Northwestern Mutual, for a whole bunch of very large consumer brands uh, that are financial services companies, we are their mortgage partner. So literally mm. their customers are actually coming to us and getting a mortgage powered by better. Um, but, you know, rather like the way that, that mortgages work is most banks, whether you look at Wells Fargo, Chase, City, their branches don't produce enough mortgages for their investment books. They okay. actually need like Wells Fargo, let's say has a trillion dollar mortgage uh, book. About 150 billion is paying off per year. And the branches are only producing 60 billion of mortgages. So those 42,000 loan officers that are mortgage brokers that Wells Fargo has aren't producing enough mortgages. So they've got to go find 60, 80 billion dollars of mortgages. What's more, the average bank spends $15,000 to make a mortgage between the commissions, the people, the process, the paperwork, the fax machine, all that stuff, all the old systems. And so if they have a choice of paying $15,000 to make a mortgage the old fashioned way, or they have a choice of paying $10,000 to better to get a better mortgage with a better consumer who can afford a house better and live a better life. They're choosing to buy mortgages on better.com. Mm -hmm. So we don't compete with the banking system for their customers. And you know, it's perverse in some cases, like you go to some of our bigger partners, like the banks, you can get a cheaper mortgage as a Wells Fargo or a Citibank or Chase customer on better.com funded by Chase City Wells than you can <laughs> at Chase City Wells themselves. Right. Yeah, that's kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, okay. That, that, I, I get it. I get it now. So um, I do want to talk a little bit about the, you know, how, your, how the underwriting is changing because we, you know, obviously we've got employee, you know, there's a lot of employ, employment, um, unemployment happening, people that did have a job when they might have started to, fill out a mortgage application, no longer have a job. How, I mean, how are you uh, managing that? That Are you doing more when it comes to employment verification or other forms of underwriting? Um, the employment verification that we have traditionally done because it's API driven has always been nearly real time. Mm. So when your mortgage broker is asking you to fax pay stubs, yes, those are dated. Right, so because you need to get the physical pay stub and fax it to them, or take a picture and email it to them, we're getting it directly off the API source. So for us to accommodate some of the changes that Fannie Mae has put in place, which is to effectively get employment verification right before you close, for us that's like an API call. For others, it's a really Herculean task, which is why we're able to continue to close, whereas others have had to literally shut down because they got to shut down the assembly line to like put the process in and then retool it and you know, take it out there and then costs a lot of money. The other thing that has changed is small businesses, uh, Fannie Mae and the FHA have changed their guidance around small businesses and now they're asking people, uh, consumers specifically, to provide a year-to-date financial state. So mm -hmm. p and and things like that. Um, so that's been a pretty huge change. The mortgage industry software in the industry is not built to underwrite small business income. 
And so like your traditional systems for them, that mainframe system to actually go and be able to like effectively integrate QuickBooks into that system. That's just like a Herculean task for them. It'll take them a year, two years. So they're basically saying, no, they're not underwriting small business owners anymore for getting a mortgage. Now imagine you're a small business owner, you have a nice business and actually you want to get cash out of your home to go and continue to keep that business going or to restart that business. We are fundamentally not serving the American public by, by how broken the mortgage industry is uh, with that. And, in, and so we're, we're able to continue to do that because we were able to integrate a PL statement and a template for all of our consumers who are small business owners in a day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so, so, so in a certain way, you know, um, one of, one of the, the CEOs of the big mortgage banks said this to me, we are able to short the past. The banks are long the past, the mortgage brokers are long the past, and we are able to short the past. And the banks and the mortgage brokers are short volatility, and we are long volatility. So volatility is good for us because if rules change, we can move and create, change our rules engine to change them. They have to change 42,000 employees underwriting guideline book. Right. It's just totally different. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, you know, I want to, um, you know, when I, before I wanted to, uh, before I talked to you, I went back and I went through better.com and I, I, ref, I, I went and did a refinance um, uh, you know, application and it really was, it was quite impressive to me because I, I, I timed it. I timed it and I spent just over two minutes. It was to basically, and I, I could have knew what I was doing, of course, and I had everything ready, but it took me just over two minutes to go from start to finish through your process. And I didn't, I did not lock in a rate though, cause I actually not complaining to refinance, but uh, I wanted to see how it works. So explain the, I'd love to hear a little bit. I know you've touched on it, but talk about the tech that you're able to put in. So someone can go from start to finish, you know, almost finish in two minutes. Um, so I think there's a couple of principles that we've always thought about, right? And it's always been a consumer first, consumer focused company. And so uh, the first thing is, how do you get the consumer something of value every single time you ask them to do something? Mm-hmm. So when I ask you to fill out a page on a form, what value am I returning back to you, right? And so you might've seen through our flow, we're returning value and providing information and guidance through the flow, we're asking you for a thing and we're, and I think we could still be 10 X better about it, but like literally through that entire process, we are engaged in transparency and communication with the consumer as to what is happening. That is how over time we get, we can possibly displace the traditional mortgage loan broker, the traditional mortgage broker for all their flaws has empathy, understands their situation. You know, humans are very good at that. So our software system takes that data. The, what the software system is able to do that any person is not is that immediately starts getting data. So when you put in your address, we immediately know a lot about your property. It's automatically through API going and figuring that out. When you enter in what the value of your property, it's automatically checking whether actually that's a reasonable value for your property or not. And if it's a flag, it's not stopping you and saying, hey, you're lying about the value of your home. You're, it's actually saying, well, let's check this. This might be a flag a little later in the process and then we're going to have to have a communication about it. So we've had to not just build an API layer, which a lot of people have been doing or an aggregating. It's not an, so we started in like 2015, 2016, aggregating the APIs. Then we started figuring out what is data that is not required, but helpful. Then we started figuring out where to, how to order the data around and what we do that, you know, so that we reduce the number of branches of dependencies. And then, you know, and branches of dependency per consumer, per consumer type and stuff like that. And then from there, how do we get the customer in and out on a refi? Because refi, you know, the consumer already has a mortgage. They're looking for savings. How do we identify that savings amount for them as quickly as possible and give them certainty that they can qualify for it? So like on refi, we think about, you know, add a click, kill a kitten, right? And just, you know, you can see that it's like streamlined in and out really helpful for a consumer to be able to see that. I think there's more we could do like in terms of surfacing other options. Maybe you have other debts that you should be consolidating. Maybe you have other things that you do that. But um, I think, you know, we, the technology behind it and all at the same time, it's pinging each unit of data it's collecting from you. It's pinging the backend engine and fulfilling criteria for 32 investors and saying, 
there's a checkbox in that VLOOKUP table equals true for these investors and then matching you with a group of investors and then their bids and then their bids and then their bids. So are there any of that group, like how, how wide is their credit box today? Are you, are you finding that, that um, there's more that you have to, that, that, that simply don't match those 32 investors that, that, that maybe would have matched uh, six months ago? Um, so the non QM marketplace has, has, has shut down a lot. Right. Um, we've worked with some community banks and some CDFIs to continue to provide funding for that product. And we've actually uh, entered into two financing agreements, with, one with one of the largest life insurance companies in the country, one with a major you know, top five bank, uh, to be able to continue to finance those. Um, because they know that the process is much less error prone and much less prone to fraud and moral hazard with better than it is in a traditional real world context. But that's really where we've seen shrinkage in the market is in non-QM and then also in, in the jumbo marketplace. So we were never actively doing five, $10 million loans for people, but generally it's become much harder to do get, to get a mortgage on anything that costs more than $3 million. Right. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. So then I'm curious about the, you've talked about sort of this powered by better product where you're powering the mortgage, uh, the mortgage origination systems for, uh, yeah, for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these banks. Do you see, I mean, when you're looking at, at the opportunity in front of you, do you see that, that as the bigger opportunity or is it just growing your, your traditional business that's farming out to 32 investors? Um, I think better will take five, 10, 15 years to become a household name. Right. Um, and I think fundamentally our goal is to give consumers a better life and a better mortgage and a better homeowner's insurance policy, life insurance policy, title policy, connect them with a better realtor, allow them to do all these things. And the power of multiple brands will always be greater than the power of one singular brand. And through the power of multiple brands, through our partnerships with Ally and American Express, we're able to reach consumers that are not necessarily going to go and go with a new fintech. Right? right, we're able to, to do all that. To give you some context, 68% of the products that Amazon sells are through third party sellers. Mm -hmm. And those tend to be the most stable and margin lucrative products that are, that are sold. And what they get the benefit of is the customer base Amazon's compiled and also all of the fulfillment technology. So uh, we think, again, you know, we're gonna be building we're going to continue building products, but we think our B2B platform and our third party partnerships are going to be an enormous part of our growth going forward. Right. Right. Okay. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's 70, 80% of our business going forward. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. There's a, um, we're running out of time. There's some several questions I really want to get to. Uh, totally. <laughs> Should I shorten is, up the questions? Yeah. One is your, um, you ran, you're one of the few entrepreneurs that actually was running, uh, you're running a, a company that in the last financial crisis, running a lender, uh, you were, you, it was a different vertical, obviously with, with my rich uncle, you was, I think it was student, student loans, but you, I, I'd love to hear what you learned from that experience, um, you know, with the last financial crisis that you can take and make uh, and implement in, in, into better within this, in this financial crisis. Um, I would say never get high on your own supply. My rich uncle was winning, was winning, was winning. Um, I even remember like our, our delinquency rates are 50% better than like Sally Mays and the competitions. And, and a lot of our competitors went out of business in 2007 and early 2008, and we were continuing to win. And I thought we would just win and we would make it, but our financing partners didn't make it. Merrill and Lehman didn't make it. And so we went down with them. And so fundamentally, that's why we created a marketplace. We said like, it's not enough to have two warehouse lines, three warehouse lines, five warehouse lines, five partners. We really actually need to commodify the capital. We actually need to create a full whole loan marketplace. And you know, that's the last thing any of these investors who are buying yield want. They want to take up all the loans. No, we've created a true marketplace. And I think that, desire and that willingness to work so hard in this dark corner to actually create that where we were getting no credit for it at better for a long time. I think that was, that was the hard stuff. And I think my experience from Myra Trunkle helped me do that. I think the second thing is liquidity. We, we just simply ran out of money. 
because our investors stopped funding us. And so what we've tried to do this, year, this time is we have just had the best financing partners and have continued to be very liquid. And, um, you know, we went into COVID with over 250 million of liquidity and, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and that just allowed us to be bold when others were fearful. Right. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So, uh, I, I want to talk about electronic closings cause it's, it's something that's been on the Holy grail for real estate, uh, all many, many, everyone in the real estate sort of ecosystem for, for a while, but suddenly we've been forced to, uh, to have, you know, electronic closing. So what, where are you conducting hundred percent electronic closings end to end today? And do you see that as sort of the way that the, 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 when is it going to become standard? I guess is my question. Yeah. So in certain States today, uh, it's still not possible to do remote notarization. Why? Because there's constituents, local, statewide constituents that want to have a physical notary present, a physical title agent present. And maybe that I, I, the future is coming fast and COVID has accelerated the future. There are all these very large incumbents almost opting, you know, operating as someone once told me, this is a very tribal business right? Like the local lender is key. The local real estate agent is key. The local title agent is key. But COVID has rendered that locality, local proximity nearly useless. Mm -hmm. And so the industry is forced to adopt the future. There are 12 states that still don't allow remote notarization. We're working with uh, regulators in those states to continue to do that. Um, as much as we can do e online and via e-closing, we are doing but I would tell you, we are very long from 100%. Right, right. Okay. Okay. And so um, you have been also pretty vocal about saying it was last year. So before the crisis, you were saying that you wanted to do an IPO sooner rather than later. And obviously things, you know, the, the, things have changed since you made that comment. But um, so are your plans you know, on hold? Do you still want to be uh, conducting this an IPO in the near future, or is it sort of been pushed out of ways? Well, I, I'm not allowed to speak about our plans, uh, but all I can say is the future is coming faster. Um, <laughs> and I have always held a personal belief that there's a social contract between America's household brands and the consumer, and that the consumer should have the ability to own a stake in the company whose products they use. Like I use Apple products. I, want, I get to buy shares of Apple stock. I understand the product. I understand the, the company and it creates loyalty. And I think this last 10 years of startups have bred this complacency about staying private and effectively making a few rich at the expense of the many. And so most of these companies should have gone public when they had the chance. If you think about the big fintechs that have succeeded, like, Square went public, had a rocky ride, but I mean, look at that valuation today, but look at yeah. it, and then look at all these other guys that, you know, being public is, is a good thing. Having your consumers be able to taste the soup and to participate in it is a good thing. So I, I firmly believe that. And I think actually, um, you know, the benefits of being public are better than ever before. The venture capital community has three to five years of mistakes that they've made in the past three to five years with overvaluing companies that are going to be paid for by the founders that they're going to be investing in in the next three to five years. So, um, so, you know, the cost of capital used to be cheaper in the private markets. I think the public markets are going to be far cheaper in the next, next decade. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so last question then. So what are you excited about most um, when you're looking at what better's got on tap for the next uh, 12 months? Yeah, what's, what's most exciting for you? The ability to transform home ownership for a new generation, one that isn't used to doing it the old way. I think, you know, uh, millennial home ownership rates are at 35%, whereas like traditionally most populations as they've entered this age have had 75% home ownership rate. So the idea that for our generation and below, we can double the rate of home ownership, double, like make the place that they call home really a lot better. That's super exciting. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, Vishal, we'll have to leave it there. It's always great chatting with you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, Peter, for having me. Always a pleasure to, to chat with you. Okay, see ya.